All right, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we are uh, on again this night. I see some people asking, hey, is this rescheduled? No, it is not. We are here. We are live. Uh, tonight it is uh, myself and Lance. Uh, Dwayne is unable to join us uh, this evening because it is his anniversary. So uh, 24 years, that's what, I, that's what I think I saw, 24 years. So uh, praise God for that. But again, uh, it'll be Lance and myself tonight, and we are going to be dealing with a uh, part two of the subject, uh, identifying the remnant. And um, I, I was not on with you all last week because I had some things that were going on that I could not be on. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into this. We're going to start with a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to do a little bit of recap. Uh, what was discussed last week, and Lance is going to lead out in the recap, and then we're going to pick up from there and con excuse me, continue on in our study um, on identifying the remnant. So can you all see me and hear me good, or is there some kind of issue with uh, my volume or something? Yeah, yeah, you sense. might want to, if you can move closer or maybe the mic or something. They might be having trouble hearing you. All right, let me see. Okay, yeah, I see what it is. Um, all right, is this better? Oh, yeah, way better, way better. All right, cool. So let, let me... Let me start this again, uh, just to recap. You didn't miss a whole lot, but <clears throat> um, Dwayne is not with us this evening. It's his anniversary. Um, I was not with you guys last week. Tonight, it'll be myself and Lance. We're gonna be picking up on the theme of uh, the remnant, identifying the remnant. Um, Lance is gonna do a little review, and then we're gonna pick up uh, and continue on with our study on identifying the remnant. So we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to jump right into the study this evening. And, uh, and then I think we will take questions at the end. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and pray. All right. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us another opportunity to uh, share your truth, to share uh, the scriptures. Lord, we pray that you would continue to speak uh, to those who have ears to hear. And uh, ultimately, Lord, we are, we, it is our desire that, um, that all be drawn to truth, all be drawn to you, uh, all be drawn into a closer walk, a closer fellowship, Lord. And to this end, we're asking that this study will accomplish that. We thank you for hearing and answering because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, all right. So before we get into IDing the remnant, uh, just brief kind of uh, view from last week. If you remember, we kind of hovered around First Peter two nine, um, and we don't need to put it up. The, well, I guess we can put it up on the screen to to make sure that you know maybe people didn't join us last week. First Peter 2.9 is the verse that we dealt with and we kind of built off of uh, because it was important to first identify what is, you know, the church before we talk about where is the church, you know, what is the church exactly? Some people think, you know, the church is a building or a church is a denomination. And so we spent a lot of time dealing with this and essentially what we were told in First Peter 2.9, uh, it said that we are a chosen generation, uh, <clears throat> Royal priesthood, oh, it's coming up. I jumped the gun. All right, First Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we identify the fact that the church literally comes from the Greek word ecclesia, where we get ecclesiastical and all these things, and it means called out ones. And the question was called out from what? called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we spent time with identifying with darkness. And, and we saw that 
in essence, all of this is, is embodied in who God is and who Jesus is and the Messiah is because we saw that Jesus is that light. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one that bridges the gap and reconciles man to God or man to himself. And this essentially is what the church is. Um, now, when we're talking about the remnant and the, the idea, well, well, I should say this as well, just, just for those that might not have been here last week, go, I definitely encourage you to go back and watch last week's, last week's uh, live stream. But when we talk about we're called out of darkness into his marvelous light, where the Bible encourages us to walk, to walk in the light, even as he is in the light. This idea that we're gonna to touch upon again, uh, that was even stressed in Revelation 12 and Revelation 14, the keeping of the commandments, doing God's will. God's commandments are the truth. God's commandments are light. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So walking in the light is walking in the ways of God you know, keeping the commandments of God. But we we want to stress and, and continue to remind us uh, ourselves that God's call, and when he calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and the expectation is that we walk in the light, we're not doing, we're not earning God's favor by our uh, our works. We don't We don't get merit with God based on our performance. How we are saved is through Christ and his righteousness, and that is all. And I think we even ended with Titus uh, 3, 5, I believe, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Uh, <clears throat> of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed on us abundantly, Jesus Christ, our savior. So it's, it needs to be understood that the call out of darkness into the marvelous light is a call to living the life that God originally designed us to live. It's recon reconciling us to God and recreating essentially the image of God and man through the process of sanctification. But now we have to kind of ID the remnant because when we talk about God's church, I think it's better to talk about God, the movement of God. Like it's not about uh, a denomination per se, it's about a movement. And we have to identify where is God's prophetic movement today? Can we identify God's prophetic movement today? And I believe, I believe we can, that's what we're gonna be doing today. And I think it's probably good to start in the book of Revelation. And, and we're gonna be doing some recaps from previous studies because it's gonna kind of bring us into where we need to be. Uh, for this for this session, but we're going to look at Revelation and look at those two women, the the women that are contrasted, the woman that's standing on the moon, clothed in the sun with the stars around her head and all of these things, and then we saw the the woman with the you know jewelry and and with the scarlet and with the wine and the one that's riding the beast. So Ivor, what what is it? What are we dealing with with these women? And we're going to recap. And, and what does that have to do with IDing the, the remnant or God's prophetic movement in the last days? Yeah. So the first thing that we're well, let me say this, that we're going to we're going to identify um, the time element of the remnant. But before we do that, I just want to go back, like I said, and we're going to look at these two, like you said, Lance, we're going to look at these two women in, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have the identity of the remnant. She comes from the woman and she's identified in two ways, keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. We need to remember, and we covered this previously, that in the book of Revelation, women are symbolic of the church. All right, a woman is symbolic of the church. And we can see that from Jeremiah 6, 2. We see it when Jesus says, uh, uh, or Paul says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, the new covenant is described as the covenant between God and his bride, meaning the church. And so when Revelation 12 speaks about this woman, it's speaking about 
the church of Christ. And then it speaks about this remnant that comes after a certain time period that the dragon is trying to persecute the woman. This remnant rises after this period of persecution where the dragon is persecuting the woman and the remnant is described as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. So once we understand that this woman in Revelation 12 represents the true church of Christ. In fact, if we go back to 12 and verse one, Revelation 12 verse one, the Bible says there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. You know, this is not a literal woman just from her description, right? The moon is under her feet. She's clothed with the sun. This is not speaking about a literal woman. The child that she was pregnant with is none other than the child, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse three, there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and they cast him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for, dev for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. So in previous studies, we saw how this child symbolize or is a uh, is Jesus himself. And we see that in these verses you have what's being described here is the birth of Christ and then his death, burial, resurrection and being caught up to the throne of God. And it is after his death, burial, and resurrection that you have verse six occurring. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. In previous studies, we thought we saw that this thousand, two hundred, and three score days um, represented one thousand, two hundred, and three score or sixty years is time period symbolized by the dark ages, right? We're not gonna go into detail about that again because a lot of this is gonna be recap, but we're, we're kind of pulling all the pieces of everything we've been studying for the last you know, few months. We're pulling it together now to demonstrate who this remnant is. So here you have the, the woman, right? She is being persecuted for 1260 years and then when the dragon sees that he could not destroy the woman during this time period, you now have this remnant coming on the scene and the dragon now turns his attention to the remnant, which is described as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 17 because I wanna show you here a second woman. Revelation chapter 17 and verse one. The Bible says here, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written, mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And let's read verse six. It says, are we scrolling up? There we go. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So here you have another woman that's being described in Revelation 17. And where is she? She is in the wilderness. Why is she described as being in the wilderness? Because the Bible says that she's drunk with the blood of the saints. Okay, let's put this together. The woman in Revelation 12, where does she flee to? She flees to the wilderness. What's happening there? 
She is being persecuted, but God is protecting her. God is protecting his church, even though it's being persecuted. They that live godly will suffer persecution. All right. When we go to Revelation 17, you have another woman, which would symbolize another church. Where is this woman? Where is this church? She too is in the wilderness. But instead of being persecuted, what is she doing? She is persecuting, right? And why is she persecuting in the wilderness? Because that's where the true woman is, okay? Here you have a description of a counterfeit church. Now, let me go into a little bit more detail here because this woman is described, if you notice, she is wearing purple, scarlet, and gold. Purple, scarlet, and gold. <clears throat> I want you to notice Exodus 28, verse 15. Because these colors, purple, scarlet, and gold, represent the colors that the priests would wear on their garments. And I want you to notice Exodus 28, verse 15. Uh, the Bible says here, Exodus 28, verse 15. It's coming up. There we go. Exodus 28, verse 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod shalt thou make it of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet. Now pause for a second. What color is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 17? Blue is not mentioned. And there is a significant reason why. So we're going to go to Numbers chapter 15. And in Numbers 15, verse 32, while, she, while we're getting there, I'm going to just go ahead and start reading. Numbers 15, verse 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in a ward because he, it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation stoned, with stone, stoned him with stones without the camp. <clears throat> and the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 37. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments and do them, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you use to go what? A whoring. Pause for a second, y'all. The woman in Revelation 17 is described as a harlot. She's not wearing blue. In the Old Testament, blue was used to symbolize the commandments of God and specifically <clears throat> the Sabbath commandment. So let's put this together. In Revelation 17, we have a woman that is an apostate church and she's being identified specifically because she refuses to keep the commandments of God and, and particularly the Sabbath commandment. Now I'm going to bring you over to Proverbs 31. Let's go to Proverbs 31 real quick. Proverbs 31. And I want you to notice, we're going to read from verse 1 to 10. Proverbs 31, beginning from verse 1. The Bible says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So I want you to notice how this is described as a prophecy. Here's what it goes on to say. What my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, <clears throat> nor for princes strong drink. Remember this, this woman, Mystery Babylon, is leading the whole world to drink of her wine. Notice what the text goes on to say. Why shouldn't kings drink wine? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. 
Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be heavy of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Notice verse eight or verse nine. Open thy mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. And then verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. So I want you to notice what's going on here. In Proverbs 31, you have two women being described. One destroys kings. One leads to forgetting what God said to remember. The other woman is described as a virtuous woman. Let's bring this back to Revelation. What you have in Revelation 17 is a description of two churches. One is ultimately the source of the remnant. The other is considered apostate. So what are we saying right now? What we're saying is that any church that teaches what the woman in Revelation 17 is teaching, number one, that it's okay to forget the commandments of God. Number two, that the Sabbath commandment itself does not need to be kept. Any church following that line of reasoning is under the title of Mystery Babylon, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother has daughters. Who are the daughters? They are other churches that are following the teachings of the mother church, which says, it is okay to break the commandments of God. So when we begin to describe this idea of the remnant, <clears throat> the first thing we're looking for is a church that keeps the commandments of God. A church that is not keeping the commandments of God cannot fulfill the description of the remnant because they are described as keeping the commandments of God. But that is not the only thing they also have the testimony of Jesus. So let's break down a testimony of Jesus. And then Lance, when, once I'm done with this, the rest of the yeah. program is you, man. I'm just listening. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Revelation 12, 17, or 19, 10. Revelation 19, 10. Revelation 19, 10 tells us what the testimony of Jesus is. In Revelation 19, 10, the Bible says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me break that down for you. So the question we want to ask is, we're going to ask this again. What is an example of the testimony of Jesus? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So pause for a second. The book of Revelation, it's a testimony. Whose testimony is it? It's the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus himself testifying of things that are to shortly come to pass. When you testify of something that is coming, what that is, is the spirit of pro your prophesying, your foretelling of events to come. So this is why in John 3, 19, Jesus said these words, now I tell you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you may believe that I am he. The testimony of Jesus is Jesus foretelling things to come, setting himself apart from any other individual because people can't foretell the future. Only God can, 
right? Watch this. How does Jesus do this for us? In John 16, 13, he says this. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you what? Things to come. The spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit speaking on behalf of Jesus of things to come. This brings us right back to 2 Peter chapter 1, 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for watch this, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by what? The Holy Ghost. So let me just, let me, let me simplify this. It was the spirit of prophecy that moved Noah to preach 120 years and a flood's going to come. It was the spirit of prophecy that moved Moses. It was the spirit of prophecy that moved Abraham. What I'm demonstrating, what I want to demonstrate to you, beloved, is this. The children of Israel in the Old Testament had the spirit of prophecy in their midst, simply meaning they were the ones who had access to the writings of the prophets and understood or were at least supposed to understand these writings because God was foretelling what was to come. What am I saying? This is what I'm saying. God's end time movement understands prophetic events. They have the spirit of prophecy. In the book of Daniel, that we're told, seal up the book till the time of the end. And then we're told something very, very interesting. The Bible says in Daniel 12, uh, Daniel 12, 4, I believe it is. Is it 12, 4, the wise shall understand, or is that 11? The wise shall understand? Yeah, I believe it's 4. Right? The wise shall understand. What does that mean? That means God's end time movement will understand the prophetic events being described in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. And y'all, the reason why this is so significant is because we are told in the book of Daniel chapter seven that the antichrist power attacks two things. He thinks to change laws and he thinks to change times. In other words, the end time antichrist system wants to confuse the world when it comes to keeping the commandments and wants to confuse the world when it comes to prophetic events. And we have seen in previous studies that it was during the dark ages that the Roman Catholic system introduced two new schemes of prophecy. One called preterism, everything is fulfilled in the past. One called futurism, Everything will be fulfilled in the future after the church is raptured away, thus bringing in massive confusion when it comes to Bible prophecy. In conclusion, God's remnant church keeps the commandments of God and have the correct understanding of Daniel and Revelation. And there is only one movement on the planet that fits that description. That is a broad description of the remnant. What Lance is going to share with you now is an even more precise. In other words, we can come down to the very timing of the rise of this remnant movement. And Lance, I will kick it over to you to you to, to go ahead and share that with us now. Yeah. yeah. And, and, sharing anything and, I've shared or kind of build on that or Whatever, but you go ahead. Yeah, and the and the uh, verses were uh, nine and ten. It's basically Daniel twelve three four nine and ten. The wise shall understand is verse ten. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, this is something to me that's overwhelmingly clear. And some people might argue and say, "Oh, 
you know, you guys are bringing up like circumstantial, you know, evidence, like maybe many different movements can fit this criteria. Uh, what we're gonna do in just a moment is go through a couple of biblical uh, prophetic exercises that are gonna demonstrate a, a, you know, a pattern, a system that God has established throughout scripture that continues to operate throughout time or not. In other words, the system that God has instituted for how this whole prophecy and remnant concept works is either going to be consistent with all of human history or somehow in the end, in the last days it's gonna deviate. And that, that essentially is gonna be left up to you to, to discover. So we're gonna circle back on the, on the, you know, we'll give you some bullet points at the end, how you can ID the remnant. But we're gonna go through some of these exercises and, and I'm going to attempt, I'm gonna make a, a frail attempt to share my screen and hopefully not devour my bandwidth. But if I do, I, I'm, it's not a problem. I'll, I'll be able to describe it without visuals, but I'm gonna attempt to give you some visuals here. And let's see what happens. So number one, and give me a second here. So let me know um, if we get some if we have some success here with the screen share. Yeah, I think you got it. <clears throat> we got full screen. Yeah. Um, if you need to, uh, I mean, we see all the slides on the side, but I think it's it's all right. You can go just like that if you want to. Can you see full screen yet, or what? Yeah, you, you got it. You can go ahead with that. Uh, if you hit play, um, begin slideshow, then we'll only see one slide at a time. So, yeah, yeah I've done I've done that. I'm just I don't know if it's lagging if it got there yet. Yeah, we see remnant right now on the screen. A surviving trace or vestige. Uh, all right, great. So number one, defining the word remnant. It's very simple. Uh, if anybody is in, you know does you know, clothing uh, design and tailoring or anything, you know, you know, with remnant when you go and get fabric. So remnant just means a surviving trace or vestige. So we keep referencing the word remnant. We've, we've saw the word remnant used in scripture and we've mentioned this in previous um, streams, but it just means a surviving trace or vestige or the, the, the that which remains. So when we talk about this movement, we're looking at where is the remnant throughout history and that will help us understand where the remnant is now. So I'm going to jump out of that and, and jump forward just to highlight a couple of points before we get to the principle. Can you see the full slide? Yep. All right. When we look at Zechariah 2.8, and I want to kind of circle back quickly to some of what was referenced because we never really took visuals on this. You, you have to understand that this persecution that took place roughly between 538 and 1798 under the supremacy of the Holy Roman Catholic Empire slash church it, it wasn't just like something that we're throwing out there that was some kind of minor episode in history and we're making a, a big thing out of it. This, this was serious. And, and there are passages in scripture like Zechariah 2, 8, when God says that he that touches you, talking about his bride or his movement, touches the apple of his eye. And, and that's dealing with, you know, the apple of your eye is like the pupil. And if you know, if you ever, if you ever got, uh, anytime something goes towards your eye, there's a meat, your body without even your participation, your body would instantly try to defend itself because it, there's automatic mechanisms in your body that uh, protect your eye because it's, it's crucial for, you know, your existence. It's not necessary. You can survive and live a fruitful life without 
vision or without the use healthy use of your eyes. But nevertheless, it's super crucial. And so this illustration helps to some somewhat illustrate the level of care that God has for his movement and what he is willing to do to preserve and protect it. Because if you strip away this movement, then the earth is what you see in Genesis 6. The thoughts of men's hearts was only evil continually. And instead of Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, no one finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that movement is the the, the remaining part, the, the, the vestige of the covenant keeping line. Those that are examples of what reconciliation to God looks like and those that are striving, those that are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God always throughout all of human history has to have a representation on the earth or else it's impossible for anybody to make an intelligent decision. There's no contrast. So this is what we're talking about. Like where, where, where is God's movement? Because that's the only way there can be contrast enough to allow humans to make an intelligent decision for or against God, to accept or reject him. He has to have a representative movement. But when we talk about this persecution, you know, we're talking about things that that were absolutely barbaric and 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 just I can't even have words to describe it. And you got to look at it, how it manifested in different uh, countries and different uh, time periods. But some historians estimate that, you know, there could have been upwards of two some say 20, some say hundreds, uh, 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 or at least hundreds of thousands, if not tens of millions that were destroyed and tortured and killed and massacred under papal supremacy for something as simple as owning a Bible or reading a Bible in a common language. Or, or reading a Bible or telling Bible stories in your home could get you uh, uh, arrested and tried and executed without any due process. And so the reason why we have records of all those things is because as you see in this picture, you know, there was, there was meticulous record keeping. They kept records of, of how they tortured what people said, what people did. Uh, and it's, it's very strange how they were able to keep these meticulous records because that's what preserved the, the reality and the horrors uh, that were committed by the church were captured by their own uh, attention to detail. And so there, in some cases, like the scene that we're seeing here, there were multiple um, record keepers documenting everything uh, they are sometimes, as in these cases, were illustrators that were capturing. If they had cameras, they were taking pictures. Obviously, this is before that, so they're, they're drawing and painting. And you can see many individuals here. Uh, and, and you can see, uh, if you look on the left, there's, uh, you know, government officials, if you will. If you look on the right, there's high papal officials. If you look, um, there's also stenographers and monks and priests and it goes on and on and on. You see a little uh, precursor to waterboarding going on in the middle. You see, see my my man getting his foot, his feet put to the fire. If you ever heard that saying, you have the individual being lifted up by his with his hands behind his back, with his shoulders being you know ripped out of his socket. Called the, this in the Spanish Inquisition, they called this being put to the question. They had physicians on site to reset bones that have been dislocated. You see torture implementations on the wall. So this, this was a very sadistic, sick, maniacal system that persecuted the church of God and, and many others. And so what did the church have to do? When we say the church went into the wilderness in this era of papal hey, supremacy, Lance, the Lance, church literally, Lance, yeah, yeah. Are you sharing it? You're not seeing it? Nope. Nope. It's still it's on. Still there we go. There we go. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, there's a major lag. So you know, just look at the, the pictures as, uh, as we go through. Yeah. But the church was literally in, in the wilderness, and 
the you know people had to hide and have services in mountains and caves and and the church would send out armies and soldiers to massacre men women and children and so god is when when the bible says that god was protecting the woman and the devil was coming at him at her like a flood uh these, these this was not just some you know these are just some interesting things that god is is talking about this was actual real life horrific persecution and it was going on for over a thousand years as a standard practice. So when we get to this concept and we're looking at a, a now at a prophetic principle and tell me what you see, uh, what you're seeing now. Yeah, the flood. What do you got on the screen? Oh, okay, we're good. All right, good. So I'm gonna illustrate, I'm gonna use probably two opportunities to illustrate this principle and then you know we're going to have to kind of wrap up and answer questions but this prophetic principle that God establishes uh, comes from almost the very beginning if i were to ask you who is the first prophet in the bible um and some people might say well adam was a prophet and i'm not going to disagree with that but the 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 prophet in the sense of receiving visions and, and declaring those visions to the people that's recorded in, in the Bible is interestingly enough is Enoch. Enoch is referenced in Jude chapter one. We don't have to go there, but in Jude chapter one, Enoch is referenced as the seventh from Adam, you know, the seventh descendant of Adam. And he had a prophetic message. And that message was, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints, right? And he talks about judgment and, and the, the coming restoration through the Messiah. This was happening all the way in within seven generations of Adam. This message was being preached on the earth to, uh, to all of the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So this 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 also gives us a little clue about the nature of the, the, the message that the movement presents in every era. And so Enoch had this ministry. So this is the, the first step in the principle I want you to remember. God raises up a prophet and he gives that prophet a definite or indefinite time prophecy. So step number one, God raises up a prophet and he gives that prophet a definite or indefinite time prophecy. Towards the time of fulfillment of that prophecy, God will raise up another prophet to apply the message of the previous prophet and the preaching of that message, the application of that message will produce a remnant, all right? So there's a prophet with a message. There's another prophet towards the time of fulfillment that applies that message. And the people that accept that message are become the remnant. And so Enoch is the first one to receive this, this uh, or, or to demonstrate this principle. But we know something interesting in the book of Genesis about Enoch. And again, you guys are gonna have to follow along because I'm not gonna put all the verses on the screen because we don't have time to read the verses individually. But the book of Genesis, when we get this little uh, table of nations and the genealogies, all of a sudden when it gets to Enoch, we get a little, some little descriptive. That's always the a, a indicator that there's some, something important there. And we're told that Enoch, walked with God, but then he was not for God took him. And we've talked about this in previous meetings. Enoch was translated without seeing death. He was brought to heaven, translated without seeing death, just like Elijah in the chariot of fire, if you will. He was translated without seeing death. So how in the world did his message continue? Well, there's something very interesting in that he built in his prophetic message in the name of his son. The son of Enoch was named Methuselah. And I hope everybody's following along. The son of Enoch was named Methuselah. Now we know in Hebrew, there are no uh, vowels in classical Hebrew um, in, in the way that we have vowels, there, it was consonants. So when we translate these names into English, the scholars that do the translation will insert the vowels based on, you know, their, their um, you know, they're doing their best job. Now, 
if you look, anybody has a study Bible and it tells you what Methuselah's name means, in some Bibles you'll see that his name means man of javelin, which some scholars say, well, that just means it was some reference to some local deity, some kind of pagan name, or he was a, you know, named after like a hunter or something like that, like an English name hunter. It just meant that he was a good, you know, he wanted to be a good hunter. Or it means something else. If you switch the consonant, uh, the vowels around, um, the translation will be, when he dies, it shall come. So his name means either one of two things, man of javelin, or it means when he dies, it shall come. Now I'm going to allow, and we're going to allow the context to, to help us know which one of those is really his name, because look at how this works. So Enoch goes to heaven. God takes him. In the name of his son, Methuselah, he, he continues his message. And, and we could do some math, and I guess I'm, it might be good to do some of this math, because I always love you know, some, some good old Bible math. I'm going to, I'm going to ask some questions and I, I don't want you guys to try to answer quickly. And even if that becomes difficult in the comments, I'm going to ask Ivor to just answer it uh, very quickly. So you got to do some, we're going to have to do some gymnastics in Genesis five to get our, our formulas correct. But the first question is going to be how old, well, Let's do it this way. When I'm submitting to you that the prophet that God raised up to apply the message of Enoch through the name of his son, Methuselah, was Noah. And the it was the flood. Now, I might be wrong, but we're going to find out what the Bible has to say in a second. And we'll be able to do this math. And Moses wasn't playing around because he, he made sure he put all of these numbers in there so the reader could understand. And once we get this, we'll be able to move quicker through the second one. Okay, question. How old was Noah when the flood began? How old was Noah when the flood began? And in order to determine that, you're going to have to look at Genesis chapter seven and verse six. Okay, they got so it. So I can't see the comments. Yeah, what did they say? 600. 600 years old, correct. All right, now let's go back and do some, some more math. Question, how old, well, Noah is the grandfather of Methuselah. So Methuselah is Noah's granddad. Methuselah's son was called Lamech, if you go back to Genesis chapter five, Methuselah's son was named uh, Lamech, and then Lamech had a son, Noah. Question, how old was Methuselah when Lamech was born? Genesis chapter five, verse 25. This sounds like a, this sounds like a, uh like a board game, man. <laughs> Question. Exactly. It's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Question. This is like, uh, who wants to be a millionaire right yeah. now? Who? Yeah. How old, can somebody come up with it? Genesis 5, verse 25. How old was Methuselah when Lamech was born? You got 187. Yeah. yeah, 187 is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the question is, how old was Methuselah when Noah was born? How old was Methuselah when Noah was born? Or, or this will be helpful if you do it this way, in case you guys are perplexed. How old was Lamech when Noah was born? Verse 28, Genesis 5. You got 187, you got, oh, I don't think they're answering that question. Um, 
182. Yeah, how old was Lamech when Noah was born? Genesis 5, verse 28. You got 182. 182. Okay, now here's the mathematics. How old was Methuselah when Noah was born? You're going to have to add how old Methuselah, Methuselah's age when Lamech was born plus Lamech's age when Noah was born. So that's going to be 187 plus 182. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah, 187 plus 182. And the answer is 369. 369. Question. How old, verse 27, how old was Methuselah when he died? Genesis 5, verse 27. How old was Methuselah when he died? He's referred to as the oldest man that ever lived. 969. 969. So Methuselah was 369 years old when Noah was born, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood began. Methuselah's name means when he dies, it shall come. And the very year that Methuselah died, 969 years is the exact time in which the flood came, meaning Methuselah died, flood came. So Enoch's prophetic message was built into the name of his son. So when Noah is preaching the message and building the ark, we know that Methuselah is aging. And, and, and this is another object lesson where Noah can point to Methuselah and he, when he dies, it shall come. And he died and it came. And Moses made sure that the readers know all of these ages and can do this math so we can calculate and see that when he dies, it shall come. So I don't wanna hear man of javelin. Methuselah's name means when he dies, it shall come. Now, God raised up a prophet, Enoch, with a very particular message, an indefinite time prophecy that was built into the name of his son. When he dies, it shall come. Towards the time of fulfillment, God raised up another prophet, Noah. Noah preached that message and it produced a remnant. In this case, who was the remnant? In this case, according to 1 Peter 3.20 and Genesis 6 and 7, the remnant was eight eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and that's it. So in this context, the remnant was though, there were those that responded to the prophetic message and accepted the message and got on that ark. That's where God's prophetic movement was in that time period. And we know that even in the midst of that, we saw a counterfeit church because we know that Ham you know, did something very egregious that we won't get into right now. And and, and the non-covenant keeping line, the counterfeit church were, were translated through that process. Very interesting. Now, before we get into the next one that we're gonna move very fast through, because to me it's even more profound because God builds on this theory throughout scripture. I don't know if you got anything to add to this, Ivor, any comments? No, or if there's no, anything in the comments that no, 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 no. All right, check it out. The Exodus. We see this applied again. So God raises up a prophet. That prophet's name is Abraham. I don't know if any of you know this, but Abraham was given a time prophecy. Abraham was given a time prophecy in Genesis chapter 15. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know the length of that time prophecy? The time prophecy was for, if we read Genesis 15, 13 to 15, we'll see that God gave Abraham a time prophecy of 400 years. Abraham was told that his people were going to be the subject of persecution. His offspring would be persecuted. He would have a son, excuse me, and that, that son eventually his name would be Isaac. And that son would be persecuted. And then eventually 
that persecution would lead into bondage into a foreign nation and eventually that bondage in a foreign nation would be would lead to deliverance okay and that deliverance would lead to a remnant going into the promised land and settling there uh, because Abraham was not allowed to settle there because in Genesis 15, we're told that the sin of the Amorites was not yet full. There were people there that God had a covenant with that had not yet passed the point of probation closing. So God was still trying to work with them and pleading with them and trying to get them to turn. And Abraham was told that his people are going to eventually be persecuted, which will then lead to bondage, which will then lead to deliverance in a foreign, from a foreign nation into the promised land. And so Abraham's given this time prophecy. Interestingly enough, towards the fulfillment of that time prophecy, God raises up another prophet. And we know already, because you guys are Bible scholars at this point, who is the prophet that God raised up? His name is Moses. Now, the reason why, now Moses is the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Moses knows what he's doing here when he's, when he's putting all this detail in here and the Holy Spirit is working with him. The spirit of prophecy is working through him to do all of this so the readers can understand. But we're given some, all of these timestamps. We're not given this with everybody, but we are told exactly how old Abraham was when he began his pilgrimage or his, or as the, in the King James it says, sojourning. So the, the, the sojourning or the pilgrimage of Abraham of Israel, because all of Israel, and this might be difficult for people to wrap their mind around, but all of Israel is inside Abraham up until Isaac is born, okay? All of Israel is inside Abraham. So that's why God can say through you, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. The offspring that's going to come and even though Isaac was the, the seed that allowed this thing to move forward, it wasn't the capital S seed that Paul references being the Messiah that's gonna come through this line. But Abraham's journey, his sojourn, his pilgrimage begins at age 75, okay? Begins at age 75. When we get to, there's something very interesting when you get into the Exodus, in Exodus chapter 12, Moses gives us a timestamp. And he tells us when the Exodus takes place. If you scroll down into Exodus 12, and I'll bring it up here, it's verse 40. In Exodus 12, verse 40, the Bible says that now the time that the sons of Israel sojourned was 430 years. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came, verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, why does Moses put so much stress on this? Even on the self same day, he made us understand that it's on the very day to the day 430 years, but that's funny. The time prophecy that was given to Abraham was 400 years, not 430. So how do we get the 30 years on top of the 400? And this is what this is that this is the exercise that God is presenting to us, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, and then, and then, like I said, I'm going to reference a couple others, and we'll go from there. But Abraham, we're told, began his sojourning his pilgrimage at age 75, okay? So that gives us 20, well, okay. When we, when we look at the, the birth of Isaac, right? And we jump over back to Genesis chapter 21. We're told in Genesis chapter 21, in verse five, that Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. So if you take 100, 100, and subtract 75, which is when he began the sojourning, how old was Abraham, or how many years had passed? 25 years. So 25 years passed between the sojourning beginning and the birth of Isaac. Now the question is, when did the persecution begin? When did the persecution begin? Because Moses says in Exodus 12, 40, that the sojourning is what was 430 years. But Abraham was told that the persecution is going to be 400 years. 
The question that we have to identify is how, why the discrepancy 400 and 430? The answer is one is dealing with the sojourning and one is dealing with the persecution. So what we have to identify is that the persecution must have started 30 years after the sojourning began. Abraham began the sojourning at 75. 25 years later, Isaac is born. The promise is fulfilled in a sense. So it, did anything happen after that that involved persecution and involved Egypt? And the, and the Bible goes out of its way to tell us yes. So when I look at Genesis chapter one, and I look here and I'm told when I read verses eight through 10, that the child grew and was weaned. Is that so Exodus another chapter one? Oh, I'm sorry, Genesis 21, eight through 10. 21, 21. Yeah, yeah, Genesis 21, eight through 10. So the child grew and was weaned. That's a timestamp. There's a there's an age associated with weaning in this in this context. And Abraham made a great feast. So there's a great celebration to celebrate Isaac being weaned because this means now he's no longer dependent. Uh, he's he's kind of like officially a human. There's even some tribes today in Africa that still don't acknowledge a baby as a human until they can walk. You know, so there's there's milestones in many of these ancient cultures that they look for to celebrate a child passing from that most at risk stage to now a fully you know, established human. And this is being marked by this weaning. So this is a big celebration. This is a big milestone. Abraham has a big feast, but at this feast, something happens. It says that the son of Hagar, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham mocking. Now I want you to hone in on that word mocking. We think that that might just be, oh, they were just joking like kids. If you have siblings, they, because Ishmael is about 14 years old around this time. So it says that Isaac, you know, that he was mocking Isaac. Now, this is the beauty, the beauty of the spirit of prophecy is we, you know, God always makes it so that we don't have to interpret things and speculate ourselves. Because when we go to Galatians, Paul makes something very clear. And I want to look at Galatians chapter um you should have it on the screen there. But chapter three, verse 14 through 17, Paul is talking about this same exact story, the story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac. And notice what Paul says in Galatians chapter three. Um, Well, let's look at chapter four, verse 29, because I want to first focus on that word uh, mocked. Notice how Paul describes it here in Galatians four and verse 29. Well, verse 28, it says, now we brethren as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Okay, so Isaac was the child of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, the, the, the one that was born after the flesh was Ishmael you know, the, the, the counterfeit fulfillment of the, prophet, the, the promise and the movement through what they did with Hagar and then the birth of Ishmael. It says, but as then he that was born after the flesh, Paul says, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So Paul, Paul is saying that, that, don't get it twisted, that Hebrew word that we translate in the King James as mocked, doesn't just mean joked around, laughed. It means that he was persecuting Isaac. Hagar and Ishmael were persecuting Isaac. And this was such a problem. It was so serious and so extreme that Sarah demanded that Abraham get them out of the camp, kick them out and exile them and ostracize them because it was so crazy what was happening. Abraham refused to do it. God had to come to him in a dream or a vision and tell him to listen to his wife and send them away. This is how crazy it got. And, I, and you could just imagine, Ishmael was raised for, for over 10 years as the son of promise, as the heir, as the one that's going to inherit all of Abraham's wealth and carry on the lineage and be the patriarch. And then all of a sudden Isaac is born and God says, Jesus comments this, on this in John chapter eight, says the, the, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son, 
abideth forever. So th this is a major thing, a major development. And th th so this wasn't just mocking and joking like siblings do, this was persecution. If, if they didn't take action, then there would have been something very bad that would potentially happen to Isaac via Ishmael and Hagar. So they had to go. Now, the question is, look at, the, look at this beautiful mathematics here back in Galatians chapter 3, 14 to 17. We're told something very, very interesting that decodes all of this for us and helps us understand why the discrepancy 400 to 430. Genesis chapter 3, 14 to 17. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Now he goes into it, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now here's the application. Now to Abraham and his seed, the promises were the promises made, okay? And he's, gonna, he's making an application to Christ, but he's using the, illustrate the story of Abraham and Isaac and the covenant given to Abraham to illustrate this. And now verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, now the law came after the Exodus on Mount Sinai, right? <coughs> it says the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Question, when was the promise made? Answer, the promise was made in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was 75 years old. The persecution began when Isaac was weaned. And what we have to do is, there's five years hanging out there, Isaac had to be five years old when that persecution began. The whole nation of Israel was being persecuted by Egypt. Hagar the Egyptian, Ishmael persecuting Isaac. And that covenant, the law came 430 years after the promise. So this is the, this is the discrepancy. God gives Abraham a time prophecy, 400 years persecution under Egypt, which will eventually lead to slavery, which will eventually lead to deliverance. Towards the time of fulfillment, when the prophecy, the time prophecy is about to end, God raises up another prophet, Moses, and he says, now it's time to deliver my people. And that produces a remnant. And we're told that that remnant is over 600,000 fighting age men that come out of Egypt, plus women and children, plus non-Israelites, plus the elderly, probably two and a half million people that accept that message and they leave Egypt and then they go into the wilderness. Now, I wanna tell you that this system happens over and over again, and we're not gonna even go through all of them, but you need to understand that this is how it works. When we talk about Jeremiah and the captivity, Jeremiah is given a prophecy of, of, of captivity and God raises the prophets towards the time of fulfillment. In this case, it's three, Daniel, Haggai, and Zechariah. Now, something very interesting about Daniel, and this is where I'm gonna to wrap this up when I talk about Daniel. Daniel is the only prophet in all of the Bible that is the one who is raised up to apply the message of a previous prophet, a time prophecy, to, of the previous prophet that produces a remnant, those that return to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. But he's the only prophet that's also given a time prophecy himself. Daniel is the linchpin of all prophecy in scripture and all time prophecy, because he's the only prophet that is the one that's raised up to apply the message and he's given a, his own time prophecy. And we've covered that extensively. Daniel is given a time prophecy regarding the Messiah. John the Baptist is raised up towards a time of fulfillment to apply that message and it produces the remnant of the first disciples. We see him in John chapter one. But that, that same time prophecy doesn't end at the, at the 70 weeks like we discussed. It ends, it's 2,300 years. We've identified that that 2,300 years starting in 457, that ends in 1844, is the is the and we we talked about the anti-typical day of atonement. We talked about all these things. Now here's the question, and here's the thing that you guys got to figure out. 
If all of this has worked throughout all of human history, throughout all of scripture, this principle that God has set up, this prophetic principle, prophet, prophet, remnant, and that's where his movement is throughout all of time, the question would be what happened at the end when we go outside of Bible times and we go into 1844, the questions you have to ask yourself is did God follow the same principle? Daniel was given a time prophecy and then it goes into 1844. Did God raise up a prophet and a movement at and or around that time period? And did that produce a remnant? And you know, when we consider this, we have to ask ourselves, who is that? Who is the prophet? Who is the movement? What is the movement that God raised up towards the time of fulfillment um, of this prophecy from Daniel 8 and verse 14? And you got you got lots of things to think about. You know, um, you know, several movements started in and around 1844, and several so-called prophets were raised up around that time. You got Mary Baker Eddy, Joseph Smith. You got uh, Darwin's ever. Uh, a theory of uh, evolution being crafted, origin of species being first draft in 1844. You got um, eventually the what becomes the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness movement. You have the Baha'i Faith movement. Uh, you, you can keep going on and on with all of these movements that kind of rose up at, at or around the time of the fulfillment of that prophecy from Daniel. And by the way, this is one of the devil's primary tactics. The devil knows prophecy. So when he knows that prophecy is about to be fulfilled, he tries to take action. What did he try to do when Moses was about to be born? When he knew that that generation that was going to give birth to the deliverer of Israel based on the time prophecy, what did he try to do? He tried to kill all the babies. What did he do when Jesus was about to be born? The Messiah was about to be born. He knew because of the time prophecy, he did the calculation. So around that time when that generation was gonna be born in that place, what did he do? He tried to kill all the babies in that place. And this happens over and over again. This is not, it's not a coincidence. So what does God, what does the devil do around 1844, between 1798, 1844? He, he tries to put up a bunch of movements, smoke screens. So you, you, know, you can't tell which is which or what's what. So when we talk about the remnant, we know that the remnant would not exist as a movement between 538 and 1798. We're talking about the last day organization. It had to come after the time of papal supremacy. After, we also, after, the, after, after the wilderness. After the wilderness. That's right, after the wilderness. It had, to, it had to arise and do its work after 1798, after that wilderness experience, after papal supremacy and the church fleeing to the wilderness, that, that last day movement had to emerge and arise after that time period, right? We know, as we've already covered many times, that the idea of the remnant, keep the commandments of God, that includes the Sabbath, obviously. And we know that it has what we said, the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, the spirit that gives prophecy. We know that it would be a worldwide missionary church, not just some little cloistered group you know, that, that's in somebody's basement or, you know, some little group that got some fledgling. It has to be a global movement because it has a global message. It has to preach a global message geared in the, and rooted in that prophetic ultimatum that God gives to the world, Revelation 14, six through 14. So, you know, you gotta ask yourself the question, who fits all of these, you know, criteria? As we talked about, is it, you know, the Baha'i faith? Is it Darwin? Is it Alice Bailey? Is it Judge Russell? Is it Edgar Cayce? You know, is it the Mennonites and the Quakers? Is it uh, Karl Marx around 1844 Communist Manifesto? Was it Joseph Smith? Is it Helena Blavatsky and the Theosophist movement, which, uh, you know, we, we don't have to get into? Who is it? And how is it today that all of these people are popping up that call themselves prophets. We have to start identifying and asking ourselves these questions and we got to answer them. And this is what the Bible is presenting to us. And there's no way around that. So if you, even if we get into semantical arguments and say, oh, this is circumstantial or this, we have a prophetic heritage that was established by God through the spirit of prophecy, through his prophets, throughout all of human history, 
that give us a principle and a model? And are we to say all of a sudden in the last days, God is gonna deviate from that model or is it gonna keep it consistent? I believe, Ivor believes, Nefer believes, Lemon believes that God is keeping it consistent and God has a remnant that we can identify that is on the earth today. So you can go ahead and, and wrap yeah. and, and ask some questions and kind of try to bring all this together for us because uh, that's all I got yeah. to say. So Lance, let's just uh, let's just say it like this: um, Seventh Day Adventist. What does that name entail? Seventh Day points to the commandments of God, and especially the commandment that has been altered by the papal power. Seventh Day Adventist. What is that pointing to? It's pointing to the culmination of all prophecy, which is the second coming of Jesus. W within that name is everything you just described, is everything we've just been talking about, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, the pointing forward to of the coming of Christ, the culmination of all prophecy. Um, this is what people need to understand, okay? Seventh, we talked about the church during the dark ages, and we need to understand that during the dark ages, God was using movements uh, and people such as Martin Luther, John Wesley, Wycliffe. He was using different people during the dark ages to restore truths that were distorted by the papal power, by the woman in Revelation chapter 17, okay? What Seventh-day Adventism is, is the combination of all of these movements that came before it, right? Seventh-day Adventists are a combination of Martin Luther, John Wesley, Wycliffe, uh, uh, Huss, all the reformers who believed and taught that, you know, and they didn't have all, they, they, were, they were restoring truths piece by piece. Yeah, progressive movement. It was a progressive movement. Baptism, the Baptist church focused on baptism. We accepted that from the Baptists. It's important to understand that when 1844 came, the rise of the Advent movement, there was no such thing as the Seventh-day Adventist church. It was literally a movement where people were coming out of the different churches and bringing all the truths from those churches together into one movement, right? Adventism was not formulated by one individual. It was, it was a movement that came from people from various backgrounds coming together, bringing their truth on the state of the dead, bringing their truth on the Sabbath. They were Seventh-day Baptists before they were Seventh-day Adventists, right? Uh, um, uh, the Lutherans, justification by faith, Right, we took all of those teachings, right? All those teachings were brought together and brought into one movement. And it was not until actually a few years later, they were like, what are we gonna call ourselves? Let's call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, right? You look at all of those other movements, they were started by an individual, right? Focused on one particular truth, justification by faith, baptism, witnessing. Adventism was not formulated by one person. There were people all over the world who were studying this 2300 year prophecy all at the same time coming to the same conclusion. Something's going to happen in, in, in 1844. And though they got the event wrong, they got the date, the timing right. And they had to go back and figure out, well, what did we miss? And this is what led them to a greater understanding of the sanctuary, of the Sabbath, of the judgment. And it is out of this so-called disappointment that came, that arose this final remnant, you guys. Listen, the Bible describes it clearly, the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus arising sometime after 1798, but we're going to get more specific. It, it has a prophetic birth certificate, and that's what the 2300-day prophecy is. And listen to me. This is why the devil is so angry. This is why he doesn't want people understanding the 2300-day prophecy because it is 
the prophetic birth certificate of God's anti-movement, right? So he doesn't want people understanding the time. He doesn't want people keeping the commandments. He doesn't want people understanding prophecy. And that's why you don't hear churches talking about Daniel. You don't hear churches talking about revelation, right? You don't hear these churches explaining the 2300. All you hear people say is, oh, you know, the Adventists have it wrong. Well, ask them, explain it to me then. Well, you know, we can't really understand it. Really? God has shown consistently, right? In 1844, God gave the prophetic gift to a woman by the name of Ellen White. And we view her as a prophet of God. She did not found the, she was not the founder of the Adventist church. The Adventist church is not based on her writings, on her prophecies. The Adventist church is based strictly upon the Bible and the Bible only. How long have we been on, Lance? Uh, 120. No, no, no. How many months have we oh. been <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least at least uh, six, right? Like October or something like that, I feel. And y'all have never heard us one time say, Ellen White says, everything we have demonstrated to you, we have demonstrated from the word of God. And basically what we're saying is, look, this movement is a worldwide movement. It is based upon the word of God. You're not going to hear from us. In order to really understand the Bible, you need these secret books. No, no, no. The Bible is the Bible. It is the source of our faith, of our understanding. And listen, if the internet was around in Jesus's day, he probably would have had no followers. <laughs> because the internet would have been like, yo, I listen, man. Jesus and his followers, they be eating flesh and blood, human flesh and blood. We got the evidence right here. That's what yeah. Satan does, y'all. He will throw all kinds of false claims. And that's why we started this program, right? Because of false claims about what Adventists, who Adventists are, what they believe. We're saying, you know what? We're gonna go word by we didn't do one program. We have done, I don't know. 20, we've done many programs taking our time, showing from the word of God, why we believe what we believe. So I think uh, we're going ahead and wrap it up here. We've been on for quite some time. So we're going to open the floor for questions. And uh, let's start with, let's start with, with this. Did Adventists predict Christ's return in 1844? So I mean, the, the, the quick answer is yeah, it's yes and no. So Seventh Day Adventists, right? So in in the what what's referred historically as the Second Great Awakening, that that basically happened in the the early to mid 1800s. The Second Great Awakening. Look it up in American history. There, there'll be Wikipedia articles about it. But within the Second Great Awakening, there was a Baptist former uh, deist. Baptist um, that started preaching this imminent return of Christ associated with the prophecies in Daniel chapter eight, verse 14. And that minister's name, or it was eventually became a minister. He was a justice of the peace. He was a war veteran. There's other things. That, that's, that man's name was William Miller. And when he went around and started preaching this message, and you can go look up his story, it created a massive movement that 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 kind of blew up out of the the eastern seaboard. He was a, he was from New England. Uh, he got connected with a, a media guy from Boston. They went to New York, and it, this thing went viral um, as as things could go viral. That was one of the hallmarks of the Second Great Awakening. Is you you had cross colony movements akin to the First Great Awakening that happened in the early to mid 1700s, and the followers of Miller's uh, teachings, basically pertaining to the, the, the imminent return of Christ associated with 1844 and the need to get ready. Um, that was a, a, a non-denominational message, uh, ecumenical message, however you want to phrase it. Those followers became called Millerites. 
And that was kind of the birth of the Advent movement because they were they were preaching and talking about everything was hinged on this cleansing of the sanctuary that they believed to be uh, the earth, meaning Christ is gonna come the second time in and around 1844. Um, the What became the Seventh-day Adventist denomination came out of that movement after 1844. So Seventh-day Adventists did not predict the coming of Jesus in 1844, but many of the people that went on to uh, become the, the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church came from that Millerite movement, which did begin with semi-predicting, which eventually became firm predicting of the second coming associated with 1844. Does that, and, does that answer and, pretty clear? Yeah, and just, to, and just to clarify this, we went over this prophecy previously, the 2300 days. We went over the fact that for the most part, this prophecy was being preached in every denomination, in every church around the world. And people were so caught up with the prophecy that everyone thought the prophecy was talking about one thing when it was talking about something else. They did not have understanding. So think of it in this way, in the same way the disciples thought that Jesus was coming to set up his kingdom on earth and experienced a great disappointment when he died, they were totally not expecting it. It is the same thing that happened in 1844. It is the exact same thing that happened in 1844. And in fact, just as the disciples, their great disappointment became the cornerstone of their movement, so the great this great disappointment of 1844 became the cornerstone of Adventism. This is not a year that we run from. It is a year that we firmly uh, 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 affirm as the cornerstone of this movement, right? We're going to yeah. point to that and show, look, before 1844, this is what they were thinking. They got it wrong. This is what actually happened in that year. And again, to see that, just go back to our study on the 2300 day prophecy and you will see it laid out clearly and plainly. All right. Any other questions? I, I, I one or two more. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you seeing the questions, Lance? Um, I mean, I see a question from Arlette Johnson, 940. So after the 400 started another prophecy starting with the 30. And I'm assuming, I can only assume that she's referring to the exercise we went through with Abraham and Moses. And so if that's the case, I hope I'm understanding your question correctly, then no, it's not two separate time prophecies. It's one time prophecy, which is the 400 years, according to Genesis chapter 15, that was given to Abraham. <laughs> The, the point about the 430 is marking a time period between the promise given or the sojourning beginning with Abraham, Genesis 12, 75 years old, and the uh, deliverance, the, the, and then the, eventually Sinai in the, in the covenant with the law in Exodus 19, verse six, and Exodus 20. So the persecution be, is beginning 30 years after the promise was given, and that's all that that was doing. So the time prophecy is 400 years. The 430 is referring to the soul journey. And the, the difference is made by doing the math between the age of Abraham when he was called to the age of Isaac when he was weaned, 25 plus 5, 30, and that cleans that up. And, and the reason why this is not speculation is because this is exactly what Paul says in Galatians chapter three, verse 17. So it's not like we're, you know, we're making, we're doing all these, jumping through these hoops and doing all these gymnastics. The spirit of prophecy is consistent through Moses to Paul in correctly interpreting that time prophecy and why the 430 was considered um, in the text in, by, by Moses himself. All right, let me, uh, there's a question. Uh, Isn't the remnant a believer in the denomination? I'll in say a it again, you broke up. In a yeah. Isn't the yeah. remnant? Isn't the remnant? I don't know why there's an echo. Do you hear that? No. 
Okay. Isn't the remnant a broad base of believers in many denominations? So I will say this quickly. Uh, the answer to that is, again, yes and no. In Revelation chapter 18, we see that God has true believers within the body of Babylon. And he says to those true believers, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin. So there are true and sincere believers scattered throughout all the bodies of these fallen churches, right? The Bible is not condemning people as much as it is, as it is condemning false systems that are teaching counterfeit ways to the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, yeah. You don't need to keep the commandments. Um, uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, confession to priests, right? These are false systems that are that are misleading people as to the way of salvation. God only has one system, and that system is what the Bible calls the remnant, right? There is a system of truth and that is the remnant church. However, within the remnant church, you have people that are not true believers, not true followers, right? They're wheat and tares, right? In right. The just, like, just like, just, just to interject, just like in the ark, there yes. was the, we had the counterfeit church in the ark. Just yeah. like Judas was in the counterfeit remnant with Jesus. I mean, this That's is right. not, um, it, this is this is the biblical example throughout all of human history, and it doesn't. It has to be consistent in the end. Absolutely. So God has yeah, so, people, yeah, scattered abroad, but He only has one remnant, right? So that's why we never say. People say, "Are you saying that Adventists are the only ones going to be saved?" No, 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 not at all. There are genuine, loving, true Christians in every movement out there, but the systems they belong to that are teaching false paths to salvation, that is what is condemned by God. Right, and, and again, just to reiterate, John 10 verse 16, when Jesus says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, you know, meaning, you know, Israel proper and specifically those that accept the Messiah, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. When God corrects all of this, we're not gonna be in heaven with denominations. In, in New Jerusalem and new, new heaven and new earth with denominations, it's, it's gonna be God with his people and his people with God. So yeah, we're not talking about if you're a member of one church, that means you're automatically lost. And then you're a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church, you're automatically saved. And, and unless you change your membership, then it, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and every prophetic period, every era of human existence, God has always had a representation of a body of believers that have accepted the light that God has revealed up to that point. And that's what this is what we're talking about. You have to know who the remnant is and what the difference is. It's a, and it's revolving as I've said around, te around the teachings, around truth. So we can't reject truth. You know, you couldn't, when Jesus came, you can't reject him. And then, you know, that's the Judas scenario. You know, this is why Judas, uh, you know, there was no remedy. When he finally violated and what did what he did, he tried to go back to the Pharisees and make it right. You know, he tried to say, oh no, take the money back. I, I've betrayed innocent blood. But he was just now sad about the consequences. You know, he betrayed the Messiah. It's, it, it was it was a, it was the most grotesque form of rejection. This is why Jesus said to him, "Betrayest thou me with a kiss? You you betraying me with a kiss? This is you know." So these are the these are the kind of things that we're talking about. We're not out here trying to say you know you better get you know if you want to really do this and you need to do. It. This is about the truth, and if you accept the truth, then this is where you're eventually going to find yourself with other people that accept the truth. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that everybody that's a member is living the life that Christ would have mm -hmm. them to live, just like the Israelites of old. Mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's the same. Wheat and tears. Wheat and tears. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Katrina, exactly. I see you're asking a whole lot of times. I've seen every time you've asked. We do have a group that meets on Mondays. Um, that's a group meeting. Um, you know, as far as one-on-one -on -one studies, 
that gets a little bit more challenging. But if you inbox either me or Lance or Dwayne or Nefer, I'm sure we can kind of figure out, you know, let me, uh, Lance, I wonder if we should mention some of the things we're, we're thinking regarding what we talked about a few uh, yesterday. Uh, no, probably not. We'll wait to roll it out all, you know, so we have yeah. places to put, point people and direct people. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll hold off a little bit. Yeah. I, I will just say this, just know that we're working on some things that we'll be able to continue this, what we're doing, but on a larger scale and addressing more issues than what we're addressing right now, because we know that people are really interested in learning more and people got a whole bunch, bunch of questions about a whole bunch of different things. So we're working on something and we will, we will let you know, you know, once we're ready to roll it out. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in prayer. I think you guys will be uh, excited about it, and I think it'll help a lot of people. So please keep it in prayer. Yeah. All right. I think that's it, man. I think we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, we've been on for yeah. almost two hours. So, Lance, would you like to lead us out in prayer as we close? Yeah. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, oh by the way, by the way. Listen, we need to put the the uh, the link for the Monday group on, but I think we I can't. Yeah, I think we lost. And that. you can't do it from your yeah. end. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we are. We just got to right. pray. <laughs> just just know that we have a Monday group. If y'all join next week or uh, join, uh, I mean, go to one of our previous videos. You'll see the link for that group if you'd like to join. So, all right, Lance, go ahead. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word uh, to guide us and to help us to uh, you know, understand what you would have us to know and to, to reveal the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercy and grace and the forgiveness of sin. Uh, we ask that you continue to bless uh, the team and, and all of those who are in attendance, continue to allow uh, us to remain faithful, give us power and wisdom to make right decisions, and help us to really um, look into these things deeper, to, to pray, to meditate upon, to research, to consider, uh, so that we can find ourselves always aligned with you, uh, that one day we may be where you are and with you forevermore. And we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. 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 For those of you asking about the rapture, we got a video on it. Just go back. I think it was maybe like five or six videos ago. We addressed the question of the rapture. Um, so uh, yeah, just go ahead and check that out and you will see the truth about what the Bible actually says about the second coming and what it does not say regarding the popular teaching of the rapture. So guys, with that, uh, God bless you all and we will see you next Monday, I'm sorry, next Tuesday at the same time. All right, blessings. Blessings.